deliver me from the deceitful and wicked man. O Son, out thy light and thy truth, that they may lead me and bring me to thy holy hill and to thy dwelling.
take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep his law. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep his law. Honor thy father and thy mother. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt do no murder. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Lord, have mercy upon us, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor anything that is his. Lord, have mercy upon us, and grant all these thy laws in our hearts. We beseech thee. Glory be to God on high, and on earth. Is it not your ways that are not just? 
when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die for it. For the iniquity which he has committed, he shall die. And again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness he has committed, and does what is lawful and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered that turn away from all the transgression which he has committed, he shall surely live, and he shall not die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm. The nation shall fear thy name, O Lord, and all the kings of the earth thy majesty. <coughs> when the Lord shall build up Zion, and when his glory shall from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brethren, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God anything to be grasped, but he ended himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even to death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, that of the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. believe him. But the tax collectors and the harlots believed him, 
And even when you saw it, you did not afterward repent and believe in it. The Gospel of the Lord. Is it my way that is unfair, or rather, are not your ways unfair? Dear Lord, keep the doors of my lips so that I sin against thee in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Have you ever felt like life is just unfair or unjust? Have you ever felt like God was ignoring your pleas of mercy and punishing you? Have you ever wondered what you did, what lesson there was to learn? Why he seems to have his gaze fixed on you and allows you to go through various trials and tribulations. And then when you beg him for some relief, there's nothing but silence. I've asked for the sickness to pass. I've asked for the salvation of my children. I've asked for children. I've asked for this pain to go away. I'm, am I being punished? If so, what did I do? I'm really sorry, really. Can we just move forward? Can this just end? Imagine for yourself thousands of invading bands of men coming into your homeland, taking your entire family and roping them up, destroying your household and stealing all of your goods, and then marching you thousands or hundreds of miles through the desert over hills into a new city you've never seen before. And once you're there, they stand you up with your wife and your children, and they start to sell you in a slave market only to never see them again. And the remainder of your life, as you spend in someone's home in the city in Babylon, you wonder what you did. You wonder why God is silent. That's exactly the point of where Ezekiel was at that moment. When Ezekiel is bringing the word of the Lord to the people of Judah, he's doing so in Babylon, along with a handful of others that have been deported due to their sin. There was three deportations from Judah to the city of Babylon. This was the first. And those people had been rounded up principally because they were the elite. They were the educated. They were the ones that Babylon looked upon and said, we can educate these people, make them like us, and send them back to that wayward little land, and they can rule it for us. So those people don't act up anymore. So those pesky Jews get quiet. And they didn't. They, they arrived in this land, had their heads shaved, and started to behave, act, and speak like the Chaldeans. And they were wondering what they did. Ezekiel's primary mission, whenever he was writing and being brought the word of the Lord, was to speak to those exiles that were already deported. Whereas Jeremiah was still speaking to the ones that remained. And both their messages were identical. God was going to destroy that land. They all would be deported if they did not die. And they would all live in the land of the Babylonians. And as Ezekiel is telling these people this message that they did not want to hear, most of them were dejected. Most of them were down. Most of them wondered what they did. They felt like they had begun some sort of repentance through previous kings. They didn't feel that bad. So why was God punishing them? And God begins that chapter by telling them directly the parables of the nursery rhymes they were so familiar of saying when they were there were no longer going to be said in the land of Israel. It went specifically like the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. What that means is the children suffer for the sins of their parents. And the Israelites, as they threw up their hands in the air and just kind of gave up and said, this isn't our fault. It's really the sin of our parents, principally our first parents, Adam and Eve, and then the other generations before us. 
who has often heard of children suffering for the sins of their parents. This is what's easy to relate to. We often have read or seen on the news some parent who gets too drunk and drives an automobile that kills their child or takes too many drugs and leaves their child in poverty and injured or a number of other factors where bad decisions impact those poor little children and we rightfully feel sorry for them and say it is not their fault but yet the Israelites were saying this applies to us they were singing in fact a nursery rhyme and in the book of Jeremiah and in Ezekiel in this reading this chapter God says you're no longer allowed to say that in Judah because this is your fault because this is your sin because of the decisions that you made is it resulted in you being here not someone else. There was plenty of sin and guilt to go around. Sure, their previous generations did sin against God. They did kill their own children. They did worship Baal. And yet, in addition to that, these people were no different. What this proverb points to is alluding that children only suffer because of their parents and what their parents do. But God is reminding them constantly that no, that is not the case. This is a message a little bit about accountability. And accountability for sin is definite, it is sure, and it will always happen, whether in this life or in the life to come. As the people of Israel sat there by the river between Tigris and Euphrates, they looked at Ezekiel for the message from the Lord, and the message was this. They were going to be there a long time. Their relatives were coming and planning on it. Their land would be destroyed, and they would not see relief. But in that message, he gives a message of hope, a message of life, a message of if repentance comes, you can experience that gift, and God desires to give it to you. But do not blame others for the situation that you're in. When thinking about accountability, I'm reminded of a story of four high school seniors. They sat around and they said, hey, tomorrow let's skip and ditch and go to the beach. Who in here has often well, remembers the days that we used to do that. You notice conspicuously the parents smirk but do not raise their hands in front of their children. But it does happen. Not in this fine parish, I'm sure. But others have skipped before. And these children drove to the beach and enjoyed their day off. And when they came back the next day, they told their teacher, um, we were driving to school, had a flat tire, and the car ended up in a ditch, but we're okay. The teacher smirked and said, well, that's too bad. You missed the quiz. But go ahead, sit down. I'll give it to you now. You're allowed to make it up. I'm so glad you're safe. They take out a piece of paper and a pencil, and they begin their quiz. And their first question is, which tire was flat? <laughs> Accountability is a funny thing. It will happen. There is a day of reckoning, and it happened for the people of Judah. From here, God corrects their faulty thinking that, hey, this isn't your parents' fault. This is truly your fault. Men should have been men. Ladies should have been ladies. It is the only path that leads to growth and forgiveness is one that accepts and has accountability for their own sin that points out, I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and only God can save me. This is the only way you become more like Christ. It is the only way that you can be like God and be adopted into his kingdom. He corrects that faulty thinking, and he tells them, don't believe that this was someone else's fault. This is your sin. This is not unfair. This is not unjust. You are the ones who are being unjust. See, in our day and age, we can walk out into the street, we can watch the news, we can hear people discuss what is fair, what is just. And you will hear all sorts of things. We need fair wages. We need fair play. This is not fair that that person is ahead. We have been doing it since grade school, wanting to be the front of the line, wanting, in my day, to clean the erasers and wipe the chalkboard. That's not the case anymore, I don't think. But nonetheless, we all want to be thought of first before someone else. And when we weren't, we said, why? 
Why does God do this to us? Why does this authority figure, whomever that may be, allow this to happen to us? Because I'm good. I'm not as bad as the other one. But yet the church is right with people who do that. We don't think so. We feel good about ourselves. We come in these doors and we worship as we should and we carry the message of the gospel to other people. And yet, who does not know brother or sister or so-and-so who would gladly gossip to you about their dirtiest secrets in order to pray for their brother and sister? Who does not know the person that would stand on their soapbox and point down at someone else and go, look at the sin that they're doing. Isn't that a shame? God is reminding these people that, sure, you know the definition of fairness, but you do not know how to apply it. Your scales are wrong. My scales are proper. My scales are just. My scales are right. And it's once we see and hear and understand and believe that, that we get an idea of what true fairness and just is. Because the reality of it is, if God was truly 100% just at this moment, there would not be anybody in here. If God was truly just, there would not be anybody left in the world. He is merciful. He is kind. He is gracious. He is also just, but he tempers that by offering forgiveness. Offering forgiveness for those who repent. See, God is not unfair because all he demands is that you recognize that sin and repent of it. A contrite heart is what leads us and have us accepted by God. Right? He will not deny that, and he promises them that exact thing. He does not promise them a big bank account. He does not promise them a home. He does not promise them children, health, wealth, or an end to their slavery. He promises them what? Life. And the people like we do today forget what a gracious gift that is. The people sat by the river saying, this is unjust, this is unfair, I am in slavery, and forget that they can be granted eternal life. See, we downplay that because we cannot conceptualize it. We cannot fathom what eternal life is. So consequently, we lower our expectations and we say we would like this gift or that gift, relief from that pain, that material wealth, that temporal need met. And we all the while, like Adam and Eve, turn our back on the one gift that he has promised us, and that is eternal life. Do not be like that. We also need to remember that God uses these opportunities of punishment and chastisement to grow his people out of mercy. He's allowing them to sit in that place, principally because he's giving them the opportunity to repent. He could have destroyed them, rightfully so, and it would have been just. And instead, he looks at them and he says, I'm giving you more time to repent. He still sends his word to them to repent. And he offers life. And they should have believed it. But instead, they sang the nursery rhyme, threw up their hands, said, Oy vey, I don't know what to do. It's my parents' fault. It's somebody else's fault. Now don't mistake me. I am not saying that every bad thing that comes your way is a direct result of your own sin. It is not. At times, things will impact you because of others who sin. At times, you will suffer because of what others choose to do. But in those moments, you need to be sincerely looking at yourself and determine whether or not God is speaking to you to grow you in grace. He uses these opportunities to not only grow you, but grow others. Look at Job. What Job suffered through is more than anybody in this parish. He lost everything and everyone that was important to him. Everybody in his life that was important was taken away. He had nowhere to turn, and he sat in the ashes, and his best friends blamed him. They told him it was his fault. 
His wife said, just curse God and die because you've got nothing left. He had no one. And yet there are scores, thousands of Christians who have been touched by his life. In times of our own pain, our own grief, our own suffering, we can look to Job and say, there's somebody who hung in there, somebody who trusted in the word, and I know God is faithful. He didn't know that at the time, and yet that opportunity has made thousands and thousands of people grow to be like Christ. Your pain, your opportunity should be an opportunity for you to go and help others grow. It should be offered to God in a sense where you are helping and pointing to Christ because that is our most important mission. In short, you should be looking inside and asking, is there a sin that I am suffering with that you are speaking to me too? And if there is, you should repent, as he states here in chapter 18. You may be suffering because of a sin. And if so, you need to be with your confessor, and you need to determine what that is, you need to repent of it, and you need to grow in grace. And if you are not, then you need to offer it up to God and grow. Share that experience and let others see that experience in you so they can learn. Now, a very long time ago, and I won't date myself by telling you the date, the dates, but I was in the Marines. In the Marines, the first thing that you do is get on a bus in the middle of the night and you drive to this smelly swamp island in South Carolina. And these very angry men jump on that bus and scream bloody murder. They tell you to get off that bus like you've done something wrong. And you stand on yellow footprints and you get screamed at consistently for 13 weeks without a break, except for when you're sleeping, which isn't that often. You do that for 13 weeks to grow you into what they call the finest fighting force ever imagined or this world has ever known. It's right above the gates you go through. And one of the lessons, or one of the things that they do is when you go to chow, you stack your rifles. And they look really cool and pretty, like a triangle by everybody. And then you put a guy out there to watch them. Because you don't take loaded weapons in when you eat. They don't mix. As you sat in there, the guard is supposed to keep it safe from other people taking a rifle. And while we sat in, while they sat in there to eat, it was my turn to watch, and the drill instructor walked up and said, give me that rifle. Now, you are supposed to do everything those fine men who scream at you all the time tell you to do. So I promptly complied. And the remainder of the day, I spent learning a very hard lesson, that you are not allowed to let anybody have that rifle. And as I ran around the platoon, Screaming at the top of my lungs, holding a rifle above my head, apologizing profusely, I learned a lesson. And you would probably have to beat me senseless to take the rifle away from me now. But it wasn't, it wasn't only I who learned that lesson because as I was throwing up and still screaming at the top of my lungs, the 35 other fine Marine recruits learned, Ooh, you don't want to give that away. You want to make sure nobody takes those rifles. And they probably kept the same lesson inside the rest of their lives. Punishment may go on after you recognize the sin. It might still be there, temporal punishment. You might still be suffering with that pain. But the reason you are doing so is not only for yourself, it's for others. And you need to keep that in mind as you're suffering to keep a stiff upper lip and to show people the way of grace. I knew one day that that journey would end. I knew 13 weeks from now if I just ran around and did what they told me to do exactly as they told me to do it every time they told me to do it. I didn't have to think why, but I knew it would end. And it did. One day the suffering will end. He might give you relief for that temporal pain. He might provide you a moment of grace here on earth, but he might not. The one promise that he is sure to keep 
There's eternal life. So thinking back to my original question, what do you do with that pain? Because it's very fancy to talk about a story from Paris Island and relate this to somebody cutting you off in traffic or taking a book from you or something else. But what about those real serious times? Like Job, if we've lost a child, if we've lost a spouse, if we are truly suffering in pain or caring for somebody who is, what about those moments? Because this is all well and good, but it's hard to get through those days. And the reality of it is, is we need to look to those moments and trust in the Word of God. Because this is the same God who offered relief to Adam and Eve. It's the same God who offered it to Abraham and Isaac, to David, to Solomon, to these people in Babylon, and to us today. He promises eternal life. And with repentance, it is ours. That is the greatest gift. And if we keep that inside, if we keep that next to our heart, if we keep that stiff upper lip, there should be no pain that distracts you and gives you death. Amen? Pray for the whole state of Christ Church in the world. <coughs> Almighty and ever living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching me to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to Francis our Pope, to Stephen our Bishop, and to all bishops and other ministers, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoice in thy, in thy whole creation, and may honor thee with their substance, and be faithful stewards thy bounty. We most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to be merciful and grant them fullness of joy in thy love and service. 
and to grant us grace sort of all the good examples of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our mediator and advocate, to whom we of the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God, meekly kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God, Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, and of all men, be acknowledged and well our manifold sins and weakness. The feet of time and time will speak as a captain, by thought, word, and deed, against thy divine majesty, so will be most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We will earnestly repent, Our Savior Christ saith unto all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul saith. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John saith. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins.
Pray, brethren, that this, my sacrifice and yours, may be acceptable unto God the Father Almighty. Give the Lord's sacrifice in thy hands, and the praise of the Lord in his name, for our good and the cause of the Holy Church. Grant, O Lord, we pray thee, for by the protection of thy holy sacraments, we may ever be defended against all the assaults of the devil, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift it unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. This is he that writes so to you. It is very neat, right, and our bound in. We should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. For with thy co-eternal Son and the Holy Ghost, thou art one God, one Lord and Trinity of persons, and in unity of substance. For that which we believe of thy glory, O Father, the same we believe of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, without any difference or inequality. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying,
that it may become for us the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Who the day before he suffered took bread into his holy and venerable hands, lifted eyes up to heaven, to thee, O God, his Almighty Father, giving thanks to thee, he blessed, broke, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. Chalice into his holy and venerable hands. Again, giving thanks to thee, he blessed and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out and for men. For the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Christ commanded and taught us, we are born to say, 
words about how to prepare for us to walk in the Jesus Christ, our Lord, the beginning of the Lord's Let us pray. We beseech thee, O Lord, that the operation of thy heavenly bounty may so possess our minds and bodies, that not our own desires, but the effectual working of the same may ever prevail within us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with the peace of God has passed with all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Mass is ended. Depart in peace. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. In the Holy Gospel, according to St. John the Divine, glory be to you, Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And it was light, and the light was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So the man said of God, his name is John. The saying came for witness, bear witness of the light, that all men for him might believe. He was not that light, but sent of every witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But his man received him, and then gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. But in the hell of his glory, the glory is in the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Amen.